Hey everyone, and welcome to Things We Said Today, a Beatles podcast that deals with anything and everything under the sun, having to do with the Beatles together and solo. And I'm Darren DeVivo, one of the three hosts of Things We Said Today. I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City uh, at 90.7 FM and 90.7 FM HD2, for you HD heads out there. And uh, we also stream at WFUV.org. You can listen anywhere uh, in the world. Same thing with WFUV app, another way to listen to WFUV radio. I've been part of WFUV since 1983. And uh, I'm here with you today now on Things We Said Today. And joining me, uh, Ken Michaels. Ken is a longtime host of Every Little Thing. Uh, a live radio program and a syndicated program as well. Unfortunately, the live show is on hiatus uh, temporarily, uh, but the syndicated show rocks on. I've known Ken since, uh, boy, the early 80s, and you think I've been at WFUV long. Ken's been in radio even longer, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome Ken Michaels. How are you, Ken? Good, Darren. A big howdy-do to you and Alan and to all the Beatle peoples. And Alan Cozen is our other host. Uh, Alan, the uh, uh, acclaimed writer and journalist who uh, for a long time was a major part of the New York Times, still can be seen in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and a variety of publications today uh, with his uh, line of expertise, not only around the Beatles, but also classical music. Uh, Alan has written a couple of books uh, on the Beatles, uh, the Beatles from the cavern to the rooftop and got that something how the Beatles. I want to hold your hand changed everything. And a good afternoon to you, Alan Cozen. How are you, Alan? I am just fine. I'm living the dream because my ambition in life has always been to be under house arrest. And here I am. That is a, yeah, that, well. That's a great way of putting it. I mean, this is a really bizarre, bizarre. I mean, I don't. There were they don't make enough adjectives to describe what we're all going through right now. And it's just you know one of the things that I find difficult on WFUV these days is finding different ways to say the same thing about what we're going through, and it's almost it's indescribable. But we're all here, holed up in our homes. You're in your homes. And it's great to have you on board with another edition of Things We Said Today. We'll tell you what the topic is in a few, but as usual, at the top of the show, Ken Michaels gets us started with the latest uh, news stories. Okay, thank you, Darren. Uh, first of all, I hope everyone listening knows about this. Global Citizen and World Health Organization announced a live streaming concert event, which is called One World Together at Home which will be including performances from Paul McCartney, Stevie Wonder, Elton John, Lady Gaga, Billie Eilish, Chris Martin, Billy Joe Armstrong, Lizzo, and others. Lady Gaga has curated the event, which is being done to raise money for personal protective equipment. And this concert will be broadcast live on April the 18th. That's this Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. It'll be on all the major networks, ABC, NBC, uh, CBS, and also on iHeartMedia. And Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, and Stephen Colbert will be hosting this event. So uh, I do know that Paul is in Sussex, England right now. So uh, I would guess that his performance would be live from there or pre-taped. Probably, I'm guessing, alone without his band. So uh, probably will be one song. That's what I'm expecting. We're seeing more and more of these live streaming events happening online, all for the best cause possible. And um, guys, are you ready for this concert? Sure. Nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, where else am I going to be? But it, uh, it's, it's funny that we're experiencing uh, this type broadcast a second time in our lifetime. Because if you'll remember, there was the one following 9-11, and that was so unprecedented to have all of the networks in sync with the same program that was, if I'm not mistaken, was commercial free, right? It was just uh, performance after performance, uh, and I was like, this is going to be something that I'm never going to experience again. 
And there was well, 12, 12, 12, 12, the, the Hurricane Sandy benefit. Right. True. Right, right. Uh, the 9 11 one, though, stands out a little, a little more than, than that does, did, though, the 12, 12, 12 one. But it's going to be special. It's going to be something very cool. By the time uh, folks are starting to hear this, it might even be the day of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm kind of hoping that Paul does Hope of Deliverance because that's the appropriate song from his catalog, I think. Hmm. And Good he call. hasn't done it in a while, too. So, uh, Not that long ago. He okay. tends to do it in, in, in uh, countries where it was a hit, mm. like Spain. Okay. He's done it in Spain. Um, although... Keep undercover would be nice, hmm. but hopefully he, just, <laughs> he doesn't do. Maybe I'm amazed. <laughs> okay, more news about Paul. He was on Howard Stern's show this morning, and we're talking on April the 14th. Uh, Howard's show on Sirius XM, and on that show, he criticized Chinese wet markets for their health risk amid the ongoing pandemic. Paul was quoted as saying. They might as well be letting off atomic bombs because it's affecting the whole world. Whoever is responsible for this is at war with the world and itself. I really hope that this will mean the Chinese government says, okay, guys, we have really got to get super hygienic around here. Let's face it. It is a little bit medieval eating bats. (sighs) They don't need all the people dying. And what's it for? All these medieval practices. They just need to clean up their act. This may lead to it. If it doesn't, I don't know what will. Paul also praised the community spirit that has emerged because of the pandemic. He said a lot of people are pulling together, and it is a great thing. It is inspiring. Very interesting uh, interview. I just finished listening to it right before our show. Did a lot of talking about uh, the Beatles and the recording studio what it was like, how excited he was when songs would get finished very quickly, sometimes doing four songs a day, (laughs) you know, two in the afternoon and two at night. He would talk about that. And uh, he was very excited about the Peter Jackson film coming out. And he did say, because Howard did ask him, when is it coming out? And he kind of hinted that we don't really know because it could be pushed back because of the coronavirus. Didn't give any exact dates. But there is that possibility. Okay. And the Peter Jackson film was going to be theatrical, correct? It was going to be in movie theaters on September the 4th, yes. Yeah, but we yeah. don't know if anything else was going to go on simultaneously, if it was going to be released on DVD the same time, uh, or whatever. So mm-hmm. we'll have to wait and see. Uh, this past weekend in New York City, the Empire State Building put on a Beatles-themed music and light show Kicking off at midnight on April the 11th, the light show was designed by resident lighting artist Mark Brickman, and the soundtrack included Beatles songs like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and A Day in the Life. New Yorkers within a window's view could have observed the show and set it to classic rock station Q104.3 to hear the music going along with it. For everyone else, they viewed the event on a 24-7 webcam and they could hear the music through their iHeartRadio listening app for a synchronized experience. And Tom Pullman, the chief programming officer for iHeartRadio, says, in moments like these, it's important that New Yorkers continue to stand united and support and encourage each other. We are excited to give our resilient city something to look forward to this weekend as we once again partner with New York's most iconic building with a synchronized music to light show. Either of you get to see this? Not from Maine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> that's no excuse. <laughs> I, I you saw still a video clip. online. Okay. Yeah, I saw a video clip of it Sunday, uh, a Sunday morning. I don't think I was aware they were doing that. Not that, it, you know, I mean, I guess I could have watched it live online. Uh, but um, I thought it was pretty, pretty wild. Yeah, I saw about five minutes of it where they played those two songs. That's all it was, right? It was just the reprise and the day in the life. At least that's all I saw on the video clip. I'm not sure if that was everything, but um, it was interesting. You know, there was some effort put behind all this because you had different lights going on at the top of the Empire State Building. And it was all coordinated with how uh, the music was presented. You know, as there was the big buildup in a day in the life, you would get different lights flashing 
you know, to show uh, the excitement and the tension at that moment. It was all coordinated with the music, and it was all, all done very well. Right. Uh, other Beatle news, on April the 10th, Julian's Auction sold a number of Beatle items. Uh, here is a list of the biggest ones. Paul McCartney's handwritten lyrics for Hey Jude sold for $910,000, nine times, nine times over the original estimate. I'm going to reveal it to everyone. Alan bought it. Just no. so I, everyone... just wanna... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> also, John Lennon and Yoko Ono's bagism drawing sold for ninety-three thousand seven hundred fifty dollars. Uh, Beatles nineteen sixty-four Cow Palace concert drumhead sold for two hundred thousand dollars. A hello goodbye music video shooting script page sold for eighty-three thousand two hundred. Ringo Starr's Abbey Road ashtray sold for thirty-two thousand five hundred. And the stage of the Fab Four's first performance sold for twenty five thousand six hundred. Interesting items all up there for bid. Well, the stock market may be tanking, but Beatles stuff is obviously still gaining in value. They it's should probably have a better investment now. Mm-hmm. They should have a things we said today auction where they auction off Ken's notes for a dollar ninety eight. <laughs> <laughs> The pen well, that Aaron DeVivo used for 99 cents. Um, the ashtray. Was it the ashtray he used in the Abbey Road Studios? That's what I take that to mean, or the Abbey Road album. It probably means the studios. Okay. They didn't specify, Darren. Hmm. <laughs> they didn't specify what years he used this particular ashtray? No. Does it really matter? <laughs> <laughs> Well, someone's going to write a book about it, so yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> All right. More news. A new book has just come out called One, Two, Three, Four, The Beatles in Time by Craig Brown. I have not read this book, but it is described in The Guardian as a social history as well as a musical one and how the Beatles affected everything around them and how they are viewed today by many fans who greatly admire them through Beatles tribute bands and International Beatles Week every year in Liverpool. It does have an intriguing sideline and characters that were tangential to the Beatles story, like Richard and Margaret Asher, Peter's parents, who let Paul live with the family at their home on Wimple Street while Paul was dating their daughter Jane, Jimmy Nickel, who substituted for Ringo when he was in the hospital for tonsillitis, and Eric Clegg, uh, the former police constable, who accidentally ran over and killed John's mother, Julia. The book does not give a flattering view of Yoko Ono, so I'm told, and spends considerable time on the life of Brian Epstein. All right. Uh, Last Tuesday, Mark, what would have been Ravi Shankar's 100th birthday, both Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr issued statements online and paying tribute to the man. Paul said, very best vibrations and good feelings from us all on what would have been Ravi Shankar's 100th birthday. It was a privilege to know such a man. His talent was boundless, and his loving spirit was the best. Happy birthday, Ravi. We miss you. Love, Paul. Ringo was quoted as saying, on this day, remembering the great Ravi Shankar, he was a beautiful human being and an incredible musician. Peace and love. And this is some of what Danny Harrison had to say, and he shared photos of his father with Ravi. And he's quoted as saying, Ravi not only was like a grandfather and father to me, but he was a dear friend who met me on my level, whatever age I was. Unique, magical, and kind. I still struggle to this day to put words to how much I miss them both. Ravi, I celebrate you today and every day with music and with laughter, many puns, and lots of smiles. Gurus bless you. Is that a great quote from Dan? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's it for Beatle News. Back to you, Darren. All right, Ken, thank you. Today's topic um, sort of was born out of my head, which is a scary thought. I get very, I've been getting very caught up in 50th anniversaries this year, last year. And this year, of course, being the 50th anniversary of the Beatle breakup, when it became official, In fact, we just passed the 50th anniversary, April 10th, when Paul McCartney's press release 
came out where he announced that he was quitting the Beatles and didn't foresee a future for the Lennon McCartney songwriting team. And although it was very McCartney centric, of course, the main purpose of the press release was to announce Paul's first solo album, McCartney. Uh, it was interpreted by the media, by the fans, by the world as being a declaration that the Beatles had broken up. We've discussed uh, here on the show uh, numerous times in, in recent months and over the past year or so that the Beatles had in all essence broken up already. It just was not something that was commercially, uh, not commercially, a publicly known fact until that press release that Paul issued on April 9th to the media and the news broke then the next day um, that the Beatles were no more. He actually, uh, but it wait, actually issued it on the 10th. The only reason that it got into the papers on the 10th is because Don Short, who was the show business columnist for the Daily Mail, I think, or it might have been the Mirror. Uh, anyway, he had covered the Beatles since 63, since the very first appearance uh, in the national news, which was when um, John broke Bob Willer's ribs um, for suggesting that his trip to uh, Spain with Brian Epstein might have been, um, you know, more than just friends. And uh, so Don Short knew them all very well, and he had obviously also cultivated um, people at Apple. And one of his sort of low-level uh, sources at Apple called him up and said, Paul is quitting the Beatles, it's all over. Don Short then called a bunch of sort of upper Apple executives, my guess would be Peter Brown and uh, Derek, until he got one of them to reluctantly admit that that was the case. But the press release actually did go out on the 10th, only Don Short beat everybody to it by having his story on the cover of his paper on the morning of the 10th. Just to clarify. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> we're all uh, know-it-alls here, you know. <laughs> Because I did think that this is 1970. This is long before instant born. news with the Internet and social media and everything like mm -hmm. that. And it needed to be time for a press release to be turned into, you know, uh, a, a newspaper article and whatnot. So but April 10th, 1970 sort of become that date uh, when it kind of became real, it became reality uh, that a very, very serious crack had opened up in the Beatles world, whether or not it was going to be permanent. I don't think anyone knew it at that time. There wasn't a precedent for a lot of established bands breaking up at that point. It had happened a number of times, but this is early on in the uh, rock and roll game, 1970. So uh, it was kind of somewhat uncharted territory for a major band to call it quits. Was this permanent or not? We now know it was, but... In any event, with 1970 being like that uh, that dividing line of Beatles and solo Beatles, I thought we should just make a take a quick look at the first singles that the four Beatles put out. And in most cases, they were also the first hit songs. A point that I often make when I'm talking with friends or on the radio at WFUV is that the Beatles had four members, all four members, all members involved in the band, had major commercially successful solo careers. And there is no other group uh, that can make that claim where every member involved, every member has had a major commercial, commercially viable solo career. How you could come up with, uh, would you consider Ginger Baker a major artist as a solo artist? Uh, well, yeah, Ginger Baker's Air Force, they put out a few albums, and um, but you're probably right. I'm talking... <laughs> I'm commercial talk, no, yeah. success. Commercial success. I'm talk, yeah, I'm talking where you had... I mean, I, and, I, and I say this in all due respect, uh, Ringo Starr, uh, clearly uh, the one of the four who had the least going for him, even he had more than one number one hit, you know. Uh, he had mega selling albums and uh no other band has had this really happen to them which is a testament to the talents of the four of them individually that they mm -hmm. immediately jumped right off the beetle boat onto the solo uh artist boat and they were almost in, without missing a beat 
uh, and became viable I, artists in their own right. Yeah, and I also like to say a lot of people don't really understand how extraordinary a feat that is. You know, there's a lot of bands out there where solo members, maybe one or two of them, have had success with hit singles or albums. But with the Beatles, it was all of them. And right. um, even even a big band like the Rolling Stones. I mean, come on. But Mick Jagger has never even had a number one single on his own. Right. Yeah, and I'm being very technical with this. Charlie Watts has released solo albums, jazz albums. They, they are not by any means mainstream releases. They're good. They're excellent. In fact, I have a couple of Charlie's jazz albums. Uh, I really enjoyed them when they came out. But again, you talk, we're talking about every artist, every member of a band going out and becoming an established uh, major artist in his own right. Even Genesis. And, I, and I'll move off this topic then. Uh, even Genesis, we had Phil Collins, a major artist. Peter Gabriel, a major artist. Mike Rutherford had significant success fronting Mike and the Mechanics. But Tony Banks released a number of solo albums, had a band, Bank Statement, classical albums. He um, is not what I would consider a major commercially viable solo artist. And then there's also some of the other members that have been in Genesis, lesser names that have not really... Uh, accomplished much so this show today is taking a look at where the four individual solo careers sort of took off uh merging with the time same time with the merging <laughs> it's, it's easy for you to say darren merging with the the time that it all ended for them as uh as a band uh so i guess i'll start let me start the conversation. Let's start. Let's go. Everyone's, you know, let's go in reverse. John Paul, George Ringo, if you guys don't mind, I wanted to start with Ringo. And uh, Ringo um, is uh, a, an interesting topic because uh, in this discussion, because he jumped out of the gate real fast with two albums within, what was it, six, seven months of each other. And uh, the title track to his second album, Boo's of Blues, was issued as a single wasn't the breakout hit for Ringo. That didn't happen until 1971 with a Don't Come Easy. And I guess Ringo intended a Don't Come Easy to be his first single. And it was a standalone single. And right out of the gate, he put himself in the top 10 in the United States with a Don't Come Easy. Can you have any uh, light to shine on this? Well, a Don't Come Easy was a major hit all around the world. And in most cases, it was a top 10 single and a tremendous song that has endured all these years, still played on classic rock radio, a uh, staple at all of Ringo's concerts. George Harrison deserves a lot of credit for producing the song, playing guitar on it. And as Ringo has said, George wrote a verse and a bridge for the song, so he helped write it. It really was a co-write, but it was mainly Ringo's song. And it's a song that Ringo is very proud of because he's always quoting it <laughs> in some of his other songs in his solo career. But um, kind of interesting about it, Don't Come Easy, is that it was actually recorded during the sessions for Sentimental Journey. It was actually done a, you know, a year before it even came out. Mm -hmm. So it always fascinates me when you take a look at the year 1970 about what was released as far as albums and singles and Sentimental Journey came out and there were no singles from it. And Buku's of Blues had the title track as a single. Uh, the first McCartney album didn't have any singles. And you got to wonder why. And, you know, you can question that. And Paul and Ringo are never asked these questions anyway. It probably is too specialized a question <laughs> to ask them. But, um, yeah, It Don't Come Easy was a huge hit. And uh, it's become a classic. It's really a perfect three-minute song. Just a great rock tune overall. And um, like I said, if you ever listen to classic rock radio, and I do complain very often that so much great music of the past is not played anymore, and uh, when it comes to Ringo, you're likely to only hear something like It Don't Come Easy and maybe Photograph, you know, on that kind of a format of radio. Oldie stations, if they still play 70s, will play some of his other hits. But um, It Don't Come Easy ha has emerged as one of his classic songs, and deservedly so. You, you made a little statement in there that made me shudder. 
oldie <laughs> stations that might play 70s music. Yeah. Are we really that old? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, just, just on that side note there, I just posted something on Facebook that concerned one of the DJs at United DJs, which is one of the stations that runs my syndicated show, Every Little Thing. They come out of the UK and they have DJs from around the world doing their own thing. And they're very proud of very innovative programming that spans many generations. And there was some comments and it had something to do with Cliff Richard and whether or not his music still gets played anymore. And um, one of the DJs was talking about how proud he was that the music on that station spans so many decades. And I heard from various people that on the BBC and in the UK, you will not really hear 60s and 70s music anymore. It's from the 80s on up. So, you know, and that has happened gradually more and more on terrestrial radio in this country. But yeah, I mean, it's it's very symbolic of commercial radio and they have a demographic audience that they're shooting for. And they feel that if they're playing 60s or 70s music, they're going to have an older audience that they don't want to attract. And the same thing is evidently happening in the UK. And it wouldn't surprise me if it was, you know, around the world that way. As music gets older, it gradually gets phased out unless you have specialized programs like Beatle programs or specialized formats like on Sirius XM. They might have, an, you know, they have an all 60s channel, all 70s channel, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, that's that's where we're at these days in radio. Well, uh, um, I've always thought of it. Don't come easy. And I want to uh, bring Alan in at this point uh, as being a great example of one of the solo songs that would have made a Beatles classic had they not broken up it don't come easy would you agree with that Alan yeah I think that actually is kind of interesting it would have uh, you know been a, a I mean as it is there were two Beatles on it so that's that's more than there are on a certain you know handful of Beatles tracks but uh, yeah I, I think it's it's definitely in their style it would have been Ringo's third uh, composition as a Beatle, uh, and it, it would have been a, a great follow-up to Octopus's Garden. And yeah, if they had stayed together, that would have been, a, I think, a classic track. I think it is a classic track, even though they didn't stay together. You were mentioning, Ken, that it was recorded uh, about a year before it was released. It was actually 14 months. It was released on, uh, it was recorded on February 18th, 1970, after what was an all-night session for um, Sentimental Journey, and George turned up and they stayed and they did some work on it. Um, mm. What I find actually just as interesting is the B-side. Can we talk about the B-sides? Oh, sure. absolutely. Because it was early 1970, that, that was the title for those of you who tuned in late, and uh, really is about Ringo kind of missing the other three. And, uh, you know, there's one verse for each other former Beatle uh, where he characterizes them in a, in a you know, uh, a warm, funny way. And, uh, you know, and then he says, you know, I hope when I come to town, I hope to see you all three. And in each verse ends when they come to town. I hope they want to play with me. I have a recording sheet for this. Um, that was actually recorded on October 3rd, 1970, during the sessions for John's Plastic Ono Band album. Um, mm, although really? John, John's not on it, although on the session sheet where it says artist and or cast, it says John Lennon, parentheses, Ringo Starr. And the title on the sheet is when I come to town, parentheses, four nights in Moscow, which was a name that always used to turn up, you know, in old bootleg discussions and nobody knew quite what it was. And um, right. so once when I went interviewed Ringo, um, I asked about it and he said, oh, it's something you read in someone's book. And I said, <laughs> au contraire. And pulled out the recording sheet and showed it to him. And, uh, he, he, you know, on the uh, bottom right hand side, it says seven and a half inch rough mix taken by Mr. Star on spool. 
Uh, it's got all the takes listed, of which there were 13, 13 marked as the best. And uh, he looked at it and said, you know, I've got no idea what this is. But it obviously was early 1970. You know, it's, it's what it is. So yeah. I'm glad you just made you made a connection that I have wondered about my whole life. Yeah. Now, hmm. the plas- John's Plastic Ono Band album, the song Hold On, John. John does, and, I, and, I, and people are going to laugh at me if I'm wrong, but for the longest time, it's John doing his impersonation of Cookie Monster, right? Right. <laughs> Cookie. Yeah. All right, good. All right, so Dan, all right, now I can relax because I've always thought that's what it was, J- John being John and just saying Cookies in the middle of the song. Well, that's what Ringo does uh, mm. in the Don't Come Easy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. when he comes to, the, to John's part. And if Ringo had that tune and decided maybe to record it or rehearse it or whatever during the Plastic Ono Band sessions, well, then there's your connection and why Ringo's doing it, why John did it. And the fact that maybe even was the two songs, Hold On John and early 1970, maybe were worked on on the same day, perhaps. Yeah, we'll find that out when we get the uh, Plastic Ono Band book that comes out in the fall. And, so and, you who, know, or actually, we could probably say, look it up in uh, Chip Mattinger's um, Landonology. Hmm. You know, you, you, and you say what you want about Ringo. Early 1970 is a very clever song, and Ringo wrote that himself. Mm-hmm. So, yep. you know, there was the ability in there to even come up with a pretty high quality song. And, uh, you know, we have talked about, especially last year when we were discussing Abbey Road and the days of and weeks that followed the conclusion of the sessions and when the actual moment that the Beatles did break up, we know that meeting, that meeting where jo- John said he was leaving, that he wanted a divorce. Mm-hmm. But there was the meeting before that where they discussed a, an album to come after Abbey Road mm-hmm. where Ringo had two songs on it. What was it? Paul for John for was it George, George for yeah, yeah. All equal. And Ringo two. Ringo, too, well, uh, he, Ringo probably wouldn't have written uh, early 1970, obviously, but It Don't Come Easy was would have been the perfect candidate to be one of the two songs of Ringo's to make it onto this follow-up to Abbey Road that, of course, we all know never happened. Uh, or maybe It Don't, maybe early 1970, maybe the music Ringo would have uh, brought to a session and uh, yeah. come up with different words. yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And, you know, it it includes a verse about himself, too, which has that sort of charming self-effacingness of Ringo's. You know, I play guitar, A-D-E. He plays the three chords. Right. I don't play bass because that's too hard for me. I play piano if it's in C, you know. (laughs) It's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of funny. Right. Very clever. Yeah. he's, He's, you know, he's like the opposite of bragging in a way, you know. Yeah. The great thing about so, that song is that at the end of each verse, when he describes each Beatle, when he comes to talking about Paul, he actually says, and when he comes to town, I wonder if he'll play with me. Mm, right. He distinguishes that from yeah. the other two. <laughs> yeah, right. I know he'll play with me uh, was well, for George, you know, the, but there's doubt when it came to Paul and Paul was the one who would pretty much isolate uh, not isolated himself, but separated himself more so from the other three. Yeah. Actually, on, on the day that uh, Ringo recorded this, Paul was in the middle of the ocean crossing over to New York on the SS France about to start work on Ram. Right, right. right. Mm. Wow. All right. So, well, Ringo's simple. So you have Bukus of Blues was his first single, just to recap. But that wasn't the case in every country. In fact, while I'm sitting here, I don't think I realized there were a number of countries where it was released as a single. I always thought it was more of a U.S. thing where uh, Capital thought that they would, uh, you know, try to see if they could crack into U.S. country radio with Ringo's Ringo's uh, country album, get a track off the country album and see if we could get some airplay on country radio in the U.S. But it charted in Australia, it charted in Germany, 
So Bukus of Blues was in other countries. Uh, and when I think of Bukus of Blues as a single, I think of the Blue Apple label. Um, but really, I think for all intents and purposes, Ringo, especially in Ringo's mind, It Don't Come Easy was the first single, the first serious go at having a hit. So but George technically, is next, what? But technically, yes. Bukus of Blues really was the first. Well, it was. And, right. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I don't know. Did, did it come out as a single in the UK? No. Yes, yeah, because so, I always thought it was just a U.S. thing uh, that it came out as a single here, although I have seen import copies of it. Uh, so then again, that shows you that how, you know, how my brain doesn't work properly sometimes. But any event. Uh, so that's Ringo. So we're going to reverse order and we go to George next. And uh, George is probably the easiest one when discussing firsts here when it came to songs and singles and hits. Because the first single was the first hit, was the first number one, all in one shot. My Sweet Lord, off of uh, All Things Must Pass, was the first George Harrison solo single. It was the first George Harrison hit. And it was the first Beatles solo tune to become a number one hit, uh, at least speaking strictly in the United States, although it was number one elsewhere. But uh, And that was released to be a double A side. And we had this discussion when I was the special guest on the Two Legs podcast about the concept of the double A side uh, and what singles were actually released as double A sides or um, what made one single a double A side and not another. Uh, Visually, Apple uh, made it clear that uh, My Sweet Lord and Isn't It a Pity were to be treated equally by the fact that uh, both sides of the single had the whole green apple. You didn't have the cut open apple on side B. It don't come easy. Uh, (laughs) Isn't it a pity? So uh, right out of the gate, George uh, put himself right at the top of the top of the charts with my sweet Lord. Ken. Mm. Yeah, it was an amazing record and it was number one all over the world. And I even read that uh, in the UK, it was, the best-selling single of 1971. Mm. So um, it's really what I call a perfect recording. It's not just a great song, but the whole production behind it was wonderful. And I do love the Phil Spector production behind it, as well as what he did on the entire All Things Must Pass album. You know, it's I, I can't say much more other than the fact that it is a great recording. And, um, of course, uh, I know a lot of fans are aware that originally Billy Preston Uh, made a recording of that, which George produced and was put on the Apple album uh, by Billy called Encouraging Words. And in fact, his version came out as a single before George. It beat George, yeah, by a week or two or three. Um, I believe it it was fairly close in time. But Billy's version only went to number 90 on the charts, on the pop charts. It did uh, go as far as number 23 on the U.S. R&B charts. And, uh, you know, it's a tremendous record, George's record. And, uh, of course, I I just mentioned Billy. He performed the song at the concert for George. Very appropriate for him to do that one. And um, Billy was on George's recording of My Sweet Lord. And, uh, you know, you look at the All Things Must Pass album, and it's a who's who of so many great musicians on it. And on My Sweet Lord alone, uh, Eric Clapton's listed, Klaus Vorman, Gary Wright, uh, Ringo, of course, uh, Jim Gordon, and members of Badfinger. So overall, it's a, it's a t- tremendous recording. It's one of the greatest songs and singles of the solo Beatles catalog, period. And it's got such a distinctive slide guitar riff, one of the most memorable of all time. And give George all the credit for that. So, you know, I think it's just an incredibly powerful and wonderful record. And that would also have been like, uh, I mean, My Sweet Lord and It Don't Come Easy would have been massive number, massive hits for the Beatles. Again, if that follow up album to Abbey Road came out, I think the dates that I have here, it's a little confusing, but uh, Encouraging Words, the album, I think, came out first. And uh, then All Things Must Pass was released after uh, Encouraging Words. But George's version 
of uh, My Sweet Lord was issued as a single first uh, and a week or two later than Apple put out Billy Preston's version, if these dates are correct. And this also says that in the UK, My Sweet Lord wasn't released until January of 71 as a single with What Is Life is the B-side, which I don't think I knew that. So, Alan, your, uh, your My Sweet Lord thoughts. Okay, um, well... You know, as much as I love the chiffons, um, I think on this one, <laughs> on this one again, um, I'm going to gravitate to the other B, other A side. Isn't it a pity? Or the American A side, since what is life was the UK. Isn't it a pity? I mean, my sweet lord. Okay, we you know we this was sort of the beginning, I guess, of the really really public version of. George's um, religious fascinations. I mean, you you get some of it in the inner light and in within you, without you. But those are those are sort of non-specific. You know, this one is. You know, really, it's it's you could you could say it's a prayer. You know, I mean, it's it's directed. It's being sung to. You know, or you know, I really want to know you. You know, it's, it's he's not talking to a woman here. He's talking to God. So, um, you know, it's. That was kind of interesting, and it was also kind of unusual. People didn't uh, tend to talk about their religious beliefs publicly in that kind of way. And in a song, it almost edged towards gospel, you know, where, where of course, that is the subject of it. But then on the other side, you had Isn't It a Pity?, uh, and isn't it a pity? I mean, by now we all know about the Beatles having broken up. I mean, when I say by now, I mean by the time the single came out. Um, and so it's really hard not to read Isn't It a Pity, uh, you know, the way we cause each other pain as kind of, you know, about that in the same way that Not Guilty, which at this point, you know, none of us had ever heard, was was kind of about that. And there is specific cause of pain Beatles related in the song at, at about, you know, just before six minutes in. And I'm not sure what the single edit was, but the album track was like nine minutes or something. It was seven minutes. Okay. It was, uh, it was really long. I guess the single was cut down to 439. So I'm not sure where this appears there, but about six minutes in on the album track, you hear in the, sort of increasingly thickening backing vocals, you hear na 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 hey Jude. I mean you can actually hear them singing it. I mean, I'm pretty sure I can hear them singing yeah, Hey Jude. Absolutely. Even. And as we know, I mean Hey Jude was was kind of a sore spot for George because in the early takes of it, you know, he had wanted to put little answering guitar figures between each line much in the same way as Dwayne Allman did on Wilson Pickett's version of Hey Jude. But Paul didn't want it, and he ended up not playing at all. We've seen the video footage. George is sitting in the, uh, in, in the producer's box with George Martin, you know, just sort of watching the sessions, and the other three are recording it. Comes up again in Let It Be when... They're discussing an arrangement of, of um, one, one of Paul's songs, and George says, I'll play whatever you like, or I won't play anything at all, like in Hey Jude, whatever it is that will please you, I'll do it. Um, so, you know, here we have like yet another reference to Hey Jude, and it's kind of hard not to think that that was a, a particular sore spot for him. Interestingly enough, when the advanced radio singles uh, were out, were released, uh, which was like about November 9th uh, in the U.S. So that was when it was starting to be played on the radio in New York, where Paul was working on Ram, you know, had been at it for about a month, a little more than about a month at that time. Very next day, he goes into the studio and which track does he record? too many people his <laughs> his uh beatles you know uh, abrasive song um and that always seemed directed at john particularly but you kind of get the feeling that you know maybe uh you know hearing george's uh song and hearing the hey jude in the end 
he decided to sort of, you know, get in there and do his. I mean, he had written it during the summer. It's not like, like I'm, I'm not saying that he wrote it as a response, but it was what came up next in his sessions. Do you think, uh, Alan, that, that putting Hey Jude at the end of Isn't It a Pity was intentional? Or maybe, just maybe, the na-nas fit, you know, in the song there. They do maybe fit in, in the terms song of, I mean, but wasn't it done more for that reason? You can hear them, really... uh, you know, just as like an in-joke or something. Uh, yeah, possibly, possibly. But since we know that there's that history with George and Hey Jude, and that this is a song about the, the pain that we cause each other, uh, mm. kind of hard not to make that assumption. I mean, it, I could be wrong. It is an assumption, and uh, uh, but it all seems to fit. There's another connection, actually, which... Uh, I've often wondered about whether or not it was me thinking too much about about this or was done intentionally. And it does actually uh, bring me to the length of Isn't It a Pity, uh, at least in the case with the commercially available single, Alan. The album version and the single version are the same same length of Isn't It a Pity. And the official time is seven minutes and ten seconds. The official time of Hey Jude seven minutes and 11 seconds mm -hmm. and the way that isn't it a pity the fade out is so long and drawn out and has that na 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 in there and the very slow fade that to me was definitely george making some sort of tongue-in-cheek reference comparison to hey jude had to have been that the song's official times would be one second different Right. Although, actually, Hey Jude right. isn't 7 minutes and 11 seconds long, but that's what the classic time is that's on the label of the single. <laughs> uh, it's a little short, a few seconds shorter than that. And then here is Isn't It a Pity clocking in at 7.10. And it has been, boy, I don't know the last time, maybe when I was a little kid, the last time I actually played the 45 on a turntable. Uh, as opposed to playing 45 in the toaster oven. I mean, what else? where else are you going to play your 45s but on a turntable, Darren? But if you listen to the album at the very, very end of the fade-out of Isn't It a Pity, the words and cause each other pain drift back in before it goes completely silent. I wonder if either one of you have ever noticed that. I can't and it probably that. is only on certain pressing, maybe. You know, because if you go into the remixed CD... Uh, you know, it may not have survived any, you know, remixing, but I'm assuming I heard this and it struck me from hearing All Things Must Pass, the album on vinyl, and my copy was a, a, an orange capital label uh, that I got in the 70s, in the 80s, rather. No, it was in the 70s. Well, whatever. I think I, I think I have heard that at the very end, but I at don't know very, if that was At the very, very end, it had to have been mixed in. Because it drifts in clearly and you hear and cause each other pain. And then it goes silent and the needle goes into the inner groove. I have to wonder, because as someone who used to listen to Top 40 radio, especially in New York, WABC, I always remember seeing uh, chart listings for the hits at that time and seeing My Sweet Lord and Isn't It a Pity as a double-sided hit. But I, I don't recall hearing Isn't It a Pity on the station. I know it was played on rock stations. Mm -hmm. I know it was played on the FM dial, mm -hmm. but I don't recall if it was played. Maybe one of our listeners can write in with us if they remember on WABC, you know, at that time, if it was played on, on AM as well. And Alan, actually, let me ask you this. I don't know if you could shed any light on this. The, 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 the double A sided single, I would assume it was the record company who would make that declaration. Uh, when a single was about to come out that they thought the B-side was strong as well. Therefore, this comes out as a double A-side. Therefore, radio will acknowledge both sides. It will go up the charts, as like Ken pointed out, as two songs. Uh, and at some point, that's, that's separated, where the B-side, which is considered the, double a, the, the other A-side, would get its individual uh, listing up the charts. I never understood that. Does that? Do you, can you shed any light on that, or might like? Well, it, yeah, it has to be that the, that that's how the label is promoting it. And Apple, as you pointed out, was a special case because 
their A side and B side labels were different. And, and this one, like Come Together and Something, had the full apple. And, and so, you know, clearly, a, so a record station getting it is going to know that it's intended as a double A side, of, of, of which the Beatles had a few. And uh, yeah, how they deal with it, I mean, I suppose they could... I don't know. It, it, it's always seemed a bit weird having a, a double A side with each song charting at different levels. I don't know what that means. If charts yeah. are supposed to be based on sales, you know, where some right. stations have their charts based on airplay or listener requests. I don't know. But uh, yeah. Now, it, it was also be... in fact other artists too, not just the Beatles. The double A side was other artists and they would go up the charts almost like they were a medley, if you know what I mean, with the, you know, the slash yeah. two songs. And then at some point they were separated and would get their own individual entries, the B side and the A side. Sorry, mm -hmm. the two A sides. Yeah. Yeah. When you had the double A side, which you had a lot of in the 50s and 60s, the only thing that made it different for, from how high each one charted would have to be airplay if the sales were the same. So right. I know in the 70s, things changed a lot and you had double sided hits where it was listed together as one chart entry instead of two separate entries of how they uh... and actually when come together and something was released at some point during its chart run, it became listed as together instead of a separate chart run. Right. Yeah, same with uh, Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane, weren't they? They were separate chart they were, runs. They were, they were separate on the charts. Mm -hmm. And Penny Lane hit number yeah. one in America and Strawberry Fields at number eight. And that's why Strawberry Fields is not on the Beatles one and Penny Lane is. Because the both songs, Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields, didn't hit number one in the UK. Did Capital consider that a double A side? It was a double sided. Yeah. But each side charted separately at that time. It changed around the time of Come Together and Something. Mm -hmm. I know I've seen it with other artists, too, when going through old Billboard charts. But, I, you know, it's always something that never totally made sense to me. But then again, by the time I was old enough to, you know, I was kind of a teenager buying music. I think that that practice kind of stopped. A B-side was a B-side. I don't recall too many. I mean, I mean, I'm not talking about like Mullet Kintyre and Girls School. Well, maybe that was a uh, an exception to the rule where Girls School did chart in the U.S. Not very high, but it charted. Although but Mullet Kintyre it, never did. Mullet Kintyre never charted no. in the U.S. But yet, when the single came out, I could be wrong, but my memory is it was clearly the new Wing single was Mullet Kintyre. Girls School was the B side. I could be wrong. This is I how don't I don't remember it that way. It. I don't you remember do? it that way. No, I remember no. it being girl school. That's all that I heard. If I heard anything at all it, on U.S. radio, it was girl school. I never okay. heard all of right. on the radio here. So I guess that pretty much wraps up George. I mean, it was all rolled into one single for George. First hit for a single with My Sweet Lord and Isn't It a Pity on the B-side. Now we go over to Paul. And it was kind of neat and compact in uh, Paul as well. His first single was his first hit, first top 10 hit for Paul all together there. And that was Another Day, uh, released as a Paul McCartney solo single, although, uh, as was later revealed, it was recorded during the Ram sessions. And Ram was credited to Paul and Linda McCartney, but Another Day in its B-side, Oh Woman, Oh Why, just solo McCartney tracks. And uh, released in February, 71. So there was uh, some distance from the McCartney album, which came out in April of 70. Quick sidetrack. And Alan's in the middle of uh, compiling this mega McCartney book. Why were there no singles released from McCartney? Is there a reason? I really don't know. I mean, maybe I'm amazed it's the obvious uh, choice, but he didn't uh, he seems not to have maybe he was adopting what had mostly been the Beatles practice and a lot of other British group practice until that point uh, which was to not release a single off the album but that the Beatles did it with come together and something so uh, 
Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of think maybe he was still thinking in terms of an album being an album, and there were really not any usable outtakes from the McCartney sessions. There was a version of um, When the Wind is Blowing from uh, that he intended for the Rupert uh, project, um, and he recorded it again during the Ram sessions, and again later during uh, Lawrence Juber's tenure in Wings. But uh, the, the, uh, other than that and a few drum experiments, there really were no outtakes left to release separately as a single. So uh, why he didn't release Maybe I'm Amazed as a single is the big question for that album. But I, I, I think he just wasn't thinking in those terms. Well, I have my theory, which, you know, I'm not sure about this, but, you know, tensions were pretty high. At that moment, and we all know the story about Ringo going to to Paul's house and asking him to delay the release of the McCartney album, and he wouldn't, he didn't want to do that. And the McCartney album came out in April, and Let It Be came out in May. Instant Karma was already a hit, but it was on the charts. Let It Be, you'd have to compete with that as a single as well. Did Paul really want to upset the others? Maybe by having. Maybe I'm amazed out as a single at the same time as the other two songs. It's just a theory that I have. And yes, it's true. The Beatles, when they were together, they had many albums from which they didn't release any singles. And singles were separate entities, although there are those exceptions. And there are plenty of solo Beatle albums that don't have any singles at all, which we will always question. But I think that could be part of it. You know, the relationship between Paul and the other Beatles probably was not very good at that moment. Did he want to release a single at the same time that Let It Be would be out? Personally, I think it would have been really cool to have them all like in the top 10 at the same time. But uh, I think that's that's my personal feeling about that moment. But, you know, I could be wrong. That's my opinion. Maybe even a single, uh, any song from the album coming out as a single meant additional contact and coordination with Apple that Paul just wasn't interested in doing, you know phone calls and, and and discussions about singles and follow-up singles to put the album out and just have nothing to do with anyone at Apple until I have to deal with them. You know, yeah, maybe that did. is the case. Yeah, he didn't want to do interviews when the first McCartney album came out, which is why he, he put that Q&A out to the press. Yeah, so that pushes us then to February 71, where Paul... Uh, pulled uh, another day and a woman oh why out of the Ram sessions. I think he recorded that he specifically did target those two songs for single release and not album inclusion. Not necessarily. Am I, am I incorrect? No. Another day is a really fascinating story. Um, first of all, it's two songs. The beginning, uh, the, the the verses. Uh, basically, you hear him doing in the Let It Be outtakes. He he has not much of the words, but he's got the chord progression and the melody. He sings it a couple of times during the Let It Be sessions, and they never pick it up and do it. But it's not finished. He then had another song called So Sad, um, which is the middle section. And if you've noticed, they're in different meters. The So Sad section is in three-quarter time. Uh, the verses are in 4-4. Four, four. But he managed to sort of stitch those two together while he was in Scotland. Uh, you know, in, in, in terms of not wanting to deal with Apple, I mean, he released his album, uh, the press al the press versions came out on the 10th with the news release. The album came out on the 17th. By May 1st, he was in Scotland, and he was in Scotland for the whole summer, uh, until October, really, uh, when he then sailed to New York to record Ram. Another Day was the very first track he recorded for Ram. And at that point, um, at least according to Denny Sywell and David Spinoza, who were on the session, um, there was nothing, he said nothing about it being a single. Um, and in fact, you know, this was, we're talking about this session for that was October 12th, 1970, uh, when he just did the backing. He later did a lot of overdubbing, the, the lead vocals, Linda's backing vocals, all that, but it doesn't come out until February 
1971. And the very day it comes out, Paul putting out a song called, you know, with a little more than the actual title, It's Just Another Day, is the day that Paul McCartney versus John, George, Ringo, and Apple had its first day in court in London. It's kind of interesting. Oh. Paul also claimed, or, 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 and Tim Geelan, who was the engineer for these sessions at CBS Studios in New York, that you know, by the time he decided to put another day out as a single, you know, he'd recorded you know over twenty songs for Ram, uh, and he basically was asking everybody, "What do you think would be good as a single?" And Tim Geelan said, "I think another day." Um, so, you know, who knows, who knows whether it was Tim Geelan's choice or Paul's choice, whether it's totally coincidental that it came out on the first day of the, of the trial, all these things, but it's, you know, like I say, it's just a fascinating story and there's more and you can all read about it in the book when it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> For instance, <laughs> another day was used in a number of movies. Did you know that it was actually written for a film? No. Nope. Well, I can't tell you what it was or any more about it, but it will be in the book. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did uh, was it just cosmetic, or do you think Linda actually did contribute to the writing of Another Day? Because she does get co-writing credit on that. That is an interesting question. Um we and have, don't tell me I have to wait for the book. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> I believe he established um, legally that she was a co-writer. Um, he always points to one line that is specifically hers, uh, the pockets of a raincoat. That's you know, When ATV sued them, he makes the case for Linda as a collaborator. And it's just that he was using a very loose definition of collaborator. Um, although he does say in this discussion that he considered uh, Man We Was Lonely a collaborative song too, he just didn't think to give her credit. You know, maybe in, in the way that John didn't think to give Yoko credit for Imagine, but it was that was collaborative too. So, you know, it was established later. Basically, his argument was that since he and John used to use each other as sounding boards and that Linda performed that function in their songwriting collaboration as well, I mean, he claimed that she also did contribute lines, mostly lyrics, not so much music, but that that was the nature of the relationship. And then years later, in another interview, he talked about how, well, yeah, yeah, Linda's... Um, Linda's role in this was really as a sounding board. So it, 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 it's hard to definitively establish. I mean, let's say Linda wrote the line about the pockets of a raincoat and, you know, maybe another couple of lines in it, but he gave her credit. But George wrote the figure in And I Love Her, which even in a lot of cover versions, they use that as part of the song. In fact, it's one of the most recognizable aspects of the song. You know, obviously the melody and the chords and all that are the, you know, composition itself. But do 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 is, you know, you know exactly what song it is when you hear that that very short figure. That was George. Paul's said on, on the uh, Scorsese documentary about George that it was George's. You would think that that would deserve a writing credit as well. So, you know, it depends, I guess, who he's dealing with, whether they get a writing credit or don't get a writing credit. And uh, he wanted to establish that Linda was a co-writer, but there was, you know, there was also a, a royalty related reason. He wanted it to be two McCartneys instead of just one McCartney. So I don't think anyone will ever definitively get to the bottom of that. It's very complicated, the whole uh, idea Absolutely. of, of uh, <laughs> songwriting and who should be given credit. Yep. There's so many ideas that George Martin brought to the table, mm -hmm. to Beatles recordings, where I could easily be okay with him getting a songwriting credit, but he never was. Right. And, um, you know, how do you define, how about, you know, when Paul McCartney writes Hey Jude and he doesn't like the movement you need is on your shoulder, but John approves it. That's right. part of, you know, 
whether you veto a line or whether you approve a line, you are involved with the song and the songwriting. Right. So John didn't write any part of Hey Jude. But he did get credit. I know that. But I'm just saying, you know. So that's the, the sounding board why... credit. That's, that's why Paul <laughs> yeah. was thinking a sounding board is, you know, part of you deserves a credit because all right. those songs he wrote without John. That, that he did say to his lawyer, by the way. He said, you know, I, I wrote a lot of songs. You know, John didn't have anything to do with yesterday, you know. Mm -hmm. In fact, he also said, or Eleanor Rigby, which is kind of, a, I thought, a really interesting um, thing to choose as an example. If you read Pete Shotton's book, he discusses the writing of the lyrics to Eleanor Rigby in great detail. And he was the one who came up with a certain number of the ideas in that song. So, uh, you know, maybe Pete Shotton should have credit for that. And yet it, it's an example that Paul used in talking to his lawyer of something that John didn't have anything to do with, but did get a writer credit for. Yeah. Well, Eleanor Rigby mm. and In My Life are the two biggest examples of where what John and Paul have said, they really, there are discrepancies between the two. Right. Right. I want to take a second to just give a big thumbs up to Oh Woman, Oh Why, the B-side of Another Day, mm -hmm. one of my favorite McCarthy B-sides. Uh, and, and, and being that you're in the middle of uh, this book, Alan, you mentioned that uh, Dave Spinoza plays on Another Day. Is it a Hugh McCracken on Oh Woman, Oh Why? Right. David Spinoza. Were they simultaneous? I thought one... Spinoza left and McCracken replaced him in the Ram sessions. Exactly. Yeah, uh, but A Woman O Y was recorded a, you know, a few weeks later. Um, and by then, okay. Spinoza was gone and McCracken was there. Okay. I didn't realize Spinoza was gone that fast. Yeah, he um, actually was only there for two weeks. And that actually comes out to only five sessions. Because in the first week, Tuesday and Thursday were canceled. And then, you know, basically what happened with Spinoza was, you know, he, he had been asked to keep four weeks free for Paul, by which he interpreted as we're booking you for four weeks. I mean, he's a busy New York freelancer. And then they canceled the Tuesday in the first week and then they canceled the Thursday in the first week. So Friday, he says, so what's the schedule for next week? And Paul and Linda weren't sure whether they were going to record or just do overdubs on their own uh, and left it up in the air. So he went home, called his booking service, and he took jobs for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of the following week. So when Linda called him on Sunday and said, okay, we're going to need you all next week, he said, sorry, I can only do Monday and Tuesday because, you know, this is how it works. You didn't tell me, you know, I mean, I, and, he, and, and she took the view that, you know, well, this is a Paul McCartney album. You should keep yourself available. And he said, well, you know, it may be a Paul McCartney album, but you go back to England and I still make a living playing for all these other people who book me. And since I've accepted the booking, I don't believe in, you know, going back on, you know, it, once I have told them I'll be there, I'm not going to say I'm not going to be there because it's better to record with Paul McCartney. So, uh, after the, he, he, played the sessions on Monday and Tuesday of that week. And after that, um, Paul went to Denny Sywell and said, so who do you know? And he said, Hugh McCracken. Hugh McCracken was on Paul's original list um, when he was auditioning guitarists. But at the time of the auditions, he was in Florida recording with Aretha Franklin uh, for her Young, Black and Beautiful album. So he wasn't available for the audition, but, um, you know, Denny mentioned him and he called him up and there was no audition. He just came right in and did it for the rest of the sessions. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Finish this book up. Finish this book up. I want to read. Hey, <laughs> hey, I'm working on it. But I'll tell you, it's, you know, we're, we're finding great. It's, it's a great story. You know, it's just a great story that so many other of Paul's biographers have just not bothered with. You know, they take it up to the Beatles and then devote, you know, the last quarter of the book to the 50 years of his solo work. And it's crazy. And I'll tell you, Ram is a fascinating part of Paul's history. Oh, yeah. Because he was so prolific then. So much stuff that came out later after Ram mm -hmm. originated from Ram. 
Right. A lot <laughs> so, of Red uh, Rose Speedway. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say one thing about Another Day? Sure. I do have audio of Paul where he's talking about the song. And he said that For No One inspired that song. Really? Huh. Because he said it's all about the working girl mm-hmm. going through uh, inconsequential things that Paul likes. Like she wakes up, she makes up, dip it in the pocket of her raincoat. Uh, the little things that you do every day. Mm-hmm. He likes that kind of story to tell. Yeah. So, And then at the same time, Denny Sywell thought that it was like, he thought another day was more like Eleanor Rigby in New York City. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, he so, was he but, was very taken with with another day. I mean, he has great things to say about it, and he um, he he especially likes that tempo change. I mean, which is a drummer, I guess he would, you know. Yeah, great bass playing on that song, mm-hmm. uh, especially in the do uh, do 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 part. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's all a over nice the place. song. It's a nice song. It was it was um, you know belittled a lot by people at the time because there was that you know we've talked about this before the John Paul divide among fans mm-hmm. and uh, you know it was a it was a cute pop top forty radio kind of song but you know it was really I thought really well done uh, really nicely written uh, has a great feel to it a very attractive melody. Mm. You know, very well structured. Mm-hmm. Another day from Paul McCartney, which brings us now to John Lennon and uh, the singles of John's uh, a little more involved here because um, depending on what chart you're looking at, what country, uh, the first single that get was released, of course, was Give Peace a Chance, which was considered a Plastic Ono Band song. Uh, with Remember Love on the B-side, a Plastic Ono Band song. We all look at them as being John's song and Yoko's song. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, uh, in fact, reached number two in the United Kingdom and 14 in the U.S. Pretty interesting for really a very simple uh, song that lacked a very strong melody but was an anthem uh, lyrically and it still charted very well in America going to 14. You have to go then to early 1970. Again, we're still in that period where it isn't necessarily commonly known that the Beatles had broken up, but John's third single, he's got three singles out pre breakup. Instant karma is the one that becomes the first big hit in this country. Top 10 hit in the U S Top five hit going up to number three. Interestingly, though, in the UK, Give Peace a Chance charted higher than Instant Karma. Uh, And in between the two was uh, Cold Turkey. So uh, a few kind of layers to John's firsts when it comes to songs and singles and hits. Give Peace a Chance uh, and then Cold Turkey and then Instant Karma. I'll tell you one thing that is always, and maybe it's the OCD in me, that is always kind of bothered me was the fact that the first two singles and the live album live piece in toronto 1969 were plastic ono band releases mm-hmm. nice neat plastic ono band instant karma was released as a john ono lennon single with yoko ono lennon's b-side who has seen the wind mm-hmm. but on some pressings with plastic ono band is on the label on the instant karma side in the u.s at least I think all singles have with Plastic Ono Band on Yoko's side. Who is in charge here with this <laughs> billing and crediting and type typesetting of the label print and who masterminded all of this? It always bugged me in any event. Must uh, be let's magic, talk Alex. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Instant Karma and, and it's, there should be Plastic Ono Band. Everything should be in line and... All right, I'll stop now. And so throw what are we to... considering his first single uh, for the sake of this discussion? So, mm-hmm. so Give Peace a Chance, really, I guess, is the emphasis track here, especially since it was a number two hit in the UK, and it did hit number one in some countries as well, uh, but only number, I'm looking here at this chart, 81 in Japan, one in the Netherlands, and in, uh, what is this, Austria. <laughs> 
so uh, Ken, give Peace a chance uh, with maybe a little crumb thrown instant karma's way. Mm. Give Peace a chance. I've I've been saying for many years is a very significant song in John's life, not just being the first single, but because it was an anthem at that time that he developed, which caught on. And um, I know that when we just discussed this, the song on the other podcast show that I do talk more talk in the first three John Lennon uh, singles, I was saying that um, and Paul McCartney himself has said that he believes that the song did help to bring an end to the Vietnam War and not single handedly. But when half a million people are singing it at the, the Washington Memorial, um in uh was it november of 1969 it did have an impact and um i think that john and yoko they may have felt that they weren't being taken all that seriously but when they saw that half a million people were singing the song then they thought people were catching on to their message and it was very important to john to spread this message of peace and that's why he used all of their events, whether it's the bed ends or growing their hair for peace or planting acorns for peace. Everything was for peace. Even putting up the Happy Christmas War is Over uh, banners, you know, long before they the song was ever written. Everything was for peace. So I think it's a very important song in John's catalog for that reason. And uh, very interesting that it was... A recording that was done, you know, in Montreal at the Queen Elizabeth Hotel with a lot of very famous people on board. Tommy Smothers, uh, Murray the K, Petula Clark, a whole bunch of people were there singing along with it. And uh, the interesting thing about the song is that what we're what we're hearing, it is true. It's what was recorded that day, but it was cleaned up because there was um, an engineer uh, named Andre Perry who owned uh, a recording studio in Montreal, who was hired to record it with four microphones and a four-track recorder. And then he cleaned it up when he went back to his studio because it was too rough a sounding recording. And he had people there at the studio adding to it to sing along with all we are saying is give peace a chance. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, there was banging on a, a garbage can <laughs> yeah. to create the beats of the song yeah. so um a very unique recording indeed and uh, a lot of people sing it in concert we do know that that ringo sings it at the end of his uh, all-star band shows along with um with little help from my friends just the chorus uh and paul has done it too very important song in 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 john's history and one that i think he's very proud of and should be Alan. Okay. Um, and, and also, you know, on the uh, technical recording side, uh, they had to add that reverb that you, you increasingly hear at the end because the, the garbage can banging and the rest of the thing were going out of sync, but the reverb sort of gave the impression that they were still all in sync, you know, by sort of displacing the sound and, uh, it, it obviously was a difficult recording to deal with as something to release commercially, but you know you're you're right. It became instantly an anthem uh, for the sort of everybody who was against the Vietnam War, and um, it, it was sung at protests, sort of edging out "We Shall Overcome" uh, for a while. And uh, but you know since it was actually released while the Beatles were still a going concern, I was assuming that you weren't going to count this as his first single. And I had originally thought of Instant Karma, but then realized I forgot Cold Turkey. So I'm not sure why Cold Turkey doesn't count. It was recorded while the Beatles were a going concern as far as the rest of the world knew, but... Um, it was recorded 10 days after his divorce announcement, so maybe it actually was his first post Beatles single. Does that make sense? Yeah, if you look at it like that, uh, yeah, sure. Um, um, it depends. It really does depend on how you look at it, because I think of Wonderwall music as being George Harrison's first album, even though he was still in the Beatles then. Right. It's true. 
you know? Okay. Um, it's still a George Harrison album. It's George Harrison in name. You know, he wrote the music. So it's the same thing. Really. So that, so that give peace. A ch okay. So I thought for a while when we were talking about this, that maybe cold Turkey was invalidated because it was plastic Ono band, not John Lennon, but give peace a chance was plastic Ono band. So. Right. Give peace a chance came out first. Plastic Ono band's first single, John's first single. Right. Uh, John. Your and then cold single. Turkey was the and second. And then cold Turkey was the follow-up single and instant karma was the third one in early 70 right so i thought we were doing the first one whichever way you look at it right i can say instant piece. karma because it's the first one that comes out as john lennon um <laughs> but anyway there, uh, they're all great singles LCD. they're they're all great yeah. singles john had actually proposed cold turkey as a single to the beatles and it was not thought to be appropriate for them because the subject, I guess, um, is a little too rough. I mean, even on John's demo, you know, just an acoustic guitar demo, it, that's pretty rough. You know, that's like uh, you really get that pain of cold turkey. Uh, there, there is some dispute about whether it really is heroin withdrawal cold turkey or one writer has said that John told him that it actually was food poisoning after having leftover Christmas turkey. Um, but he, <laughs> but he decided to say that it was about, you know, heroin withdrawal, cold turkey, because the other reason is too silly. Um, mm -hmm. So either way, I mean, let's take it, let's take it at, at his word about, the heroin withdrawal. I mean, I think he really captures the sort of harrowing aspect of it, you know, and it, you know, and plus Eric Clapton's guitar figures in there are really perfect for what that song is supposed to be. But I, I don't know whether I'm supposed to be talking about cold turkey, give peace a chance or in karma. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> confused. Well, uh, I was going to say, uh, wasn't it true that the lyric to Cold Turkey originally was Cold Turkey has given me the runs? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, no, actually, the way, the way I kind of looked at it and started it off here, Give Peace a Chance was the first single, and it was a hit. Okay. Instant Karma in the United States, the first one to go into the top ten, just kind of casually mentioning that on the side. I went off on my little OCD tangent of the fact that Instant Karma is so confusingly credited. Uh, and while the uh, Give Peace a Chance and Cold Turkey were very neat, Plastic Ono Band, both sides. Yeah. Thank you very much. So Give Peace a um, Chance, you know, it's a very singable chorus. No one ever, I don't think, really sings the verses. I think John pretty much ad libbed them. And the actual verses, you know, were, were so topical and so to do with who was in the room and who he had recently been talking to that it didn't matter. So, so basically this song has lived an incredible life on the basis of its chorus alone. And you don't run into that very much either, you know. That's no, good. good point. It's um, tough to remember all the words. Yeah, <laughs> or even make them out from the... <laughs> Do we, do we know who was playing the garbage pail in the room? I don't know. Yeah, I bet you can see it on the video, but I can't remember it. I, I, I'm, for some reason, I want to guess it was Mal Evans or something. Was he even yeah. there? <laughs> was Mal on, uh, on hand? Yeah, I don't know. The, uh, the, wasn't it the, Mon the, uh, the Canadian or the Montreal chapter of the uh, uh, Krishna, Hare Krishna Temple oh, was in the room be. as well? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So... Uh, I actually, one of the thrills for me was getting to be, go into what is now referred to, I guess, something to the effect of the John and Yoko suite in that hotel. Right. Um, I, having stayed in that hotel twice and both times getting, uh, asking if I, if there was a way to see the room and luckily both times the room was vacant. Uh, but just walking in there, you just get this whoosh of holy smoke, the bed in the second bed in happened in here and Give Peace a Chance was recorded right here, right in this spot I'm standing at right now. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so Give Peace a Chance was John's first single, period. And it was his first hit, period. And was the first hit for a Beatle. 
because uh, John was releasing singles from the mid of middle of 1969 and uh, and had three singles out by the time McCartney's April 10th announcement was made. Instant Karma being the one in this country that was the first to go into the top 10 and thus becoming the first top 10 U.S. hit for a Beatle. But uh, I, I guess that pretty much closes things out unless someone wants to chime in with something else. One thing about the single Get Peace a Chance, which I also find fascinating looking back in retrospect, the B-side, Remember Love, uh, a Plastic Ono Band song, but it's Yoko's tune and it's a lovely acoustic ballad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for most folks who didn't buy Two Virgins and who didn't buy Life with the Lions, it was the first bit of music many were hearing from Yoko. It was not, as we now know, a sign of things to come. Uh, from Yoko, though. But it is a lovely song, Remember Love. Mm -hmm. Well, her music is a mixture of songs like that and also the songs that people look at as just being screaming or vocal improvisation. But she has done quite a lot of very pretty songs on her own. Like but Remember at that love. point, when you're talking 69, 70, you know what I mean? For those who might have been a little skeptical about uh, the B-side of the single uh, having a Yoko vocal, oh, but mm -hmm. it's a nice song. That was about to change with uh, Don't Worry Kyoko and definitely later in 70 uh, when Mother came out with uh, Touch Me, not Touch Me, uh, that was Power to the People in the U.S. Uh, why was Mother's B-side? Anyway. But Yoko also had Who Has Seen the Wind, right. which was that the B-side of Instant that was a Karma, good which is a very pretty song there. And Happy Christmas had Listen, the Snow is Falling. Uh, which Correct. was another uh, pretty terrific tune. But uh, that basically, I guess, wraps it up uh, with our singles, first singles from the solo Beatles. I guess at some point we probably might want to talk about albums, but uh, we we be out of time right now. So let's go around the horn and uh, get everyone's closing contact information, starting with Ken. Okay, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. You will find a brand new interview that I just did with the author Ted Montgomery, who uh, just recently put out a brand new book called The Paul McCartney Catalog, which covers everything that Paul has released in his solo career through the end of 2019. There will be a new interview coming very soon on the same page of my website, which is interviews page four, with Jerry Hammock, who has put out a whole series of books on the Beatles, uh, the Beatles Recording Reference Manual. That's coming soon. There's also a page on my website for my syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, which lists all the radio stations that carry it and their broadcast times and links to their websites if you want to stream them. There's a brand new show that's airing this week with Jerry Hammock as a special guest uh don't forget there's my beatles trivia and games page on the website where you can win one of nine prizes including ted montgomery's new book uh talk more talk the next show will be this coming monday which is the 20th of april and it's all going to be about the public announcement of the breakup of the beatles as we just uh passed the 50th anniversary of that our thoughts all about that and that's with kid o'toole tom hunyadi and mean mr mayo which you can check out on our facebook page talk more talk a solo beatles video cast the live broadcast of every little thing is on hold until things get straightened out with the pandemic and uh, i believe that's everything all right alan you up Okay. Um, easiest way to get in touch with me is through Facebook at um, either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, my alter ego. Uh, that's where most of the Beatles related stuff is when I have anything to post there. You can reach all of us uh, by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. I'll read that again because it's long. Things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at Things We Said Fab. We have a couple of Facebook pages. The main one is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans, 
And there's also one that's just things we said today. The show gets posted on both of those. So that's it for me. Okay. All right, Darren, your turn. All right, thanks. Uh, you could send me an email at WFUV. My WFUV email address is Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Uh, that's D A R R E N D E V I V O at W F U V dot org. W F U V is spelled. Do- anyway, uh, you could go to Facebook and uh, join my radio page, Darren DeVivo on W F U V radio. Uh, I have a personal page as well. I'd love if you join me, though, at the radio page, but it, I guess it's more most important that you reach out and 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 touch me that doesn't sound right but you know what i'm saying on facebook uh and as for the radio shows things are a little wacky now of course well every aspect of our lives uh, is wacky right now like a lot of uh broadcasting outfits everyone at wfuv is hosting shows from home our studios are officially closed and so uh and my sh- and, and in my case my shifts have changed My air shifts temporarily, my weeknight show, Monday through Thursday nights, normally 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern time, has been trimmed to 10 p.m. to midnight, uh, Monday through Thursday nights. And I'm on the air on Saturday afternoons temporarily from 1 to 4 in the afternoon. Normally, I would be on WFUV's HD2 channel uh, through the weekend, but uh, they've moved me over to the main WFUV one to four Saturday afternoons uh, because our sports show is on hiatus. And uh, this coming Friday, about probably by the time you hear this show, it will have passed, but I will be on the air Friday as well in the midday period. I won't get into the details because that's just this coming Friday. And again, many of you will hear the show after that particular date. So, and uh, so I guess that's it. Uh, another, uh, edition of things we said today in the books and it was always a thrill uh hanging out with you and spending time with you ken and alan and uh, we'll be back uh in two weeks in fact all three of us will probably be in the same exact spot we're in right now in two weeks so uh for alan and ken this is darren devivo this is things we said today stay healthy stay well and we'll see you next time mm-hmm.